feet from the theme a week later, and it's still Easter. A week later, and it is still Easter. As I said earlier, this is the second Sunday of Easter because Easter is a season, not just one day. We named earlier that there are 50 days of Easter leading up to the day of Pentecost. But the Sunday after Easter is known as Low Sunday for obvious reasons, uh, whereas we were in, you know, many people around the world uh, packed out churches and we had wonderful dinners. The fanfare decreases on the Sunday after Easter, amen. The Easter lilies have wilted and are losing their scent. All the remaining Easter candy is 75% off the grocery store, amen. Mm -hmm. Stuffed Easter bunnies are $3 at Kenny's, I checked, amen. <laughs> but you know, the older I get, the more complex Easter becomes. And this is because, as one theologian put it, the resurrection is untidy business. Theological perspectives surrounding the events of Holy Week um, and Easter Sunday are many. I've said this before, that I've always felt that Easter was bigger than my comprehension, but like many folks, that didn't keep me from just trying to tidy up the story and reduce it to a theory or to a psalm of which I had inherited. Theologian Brian Zahn, he wrestles as well. He asks the question, when we say Jesus died for our sins, what does that mean? He, he goes on to say, it is undeniably an essential confession of Christian faith, but how does it work? This much I'm sure of, it is not reducible to just one thing. To try to reduce the death of Jesus to a single meaning is an impoverished approach to the mystery of the cross, Plus, according to this theologian. And he makes me ponder. Yes, it is complex, and yet I, I love Easter. I think uh, there is something pretty noble, you know, uh, about all the efforts that we make on Easter because there is a whole lot of activity on Easter. Amen. Some folk have on new clothes, pastels are officially in season, amen. <laughs> uh, the Easter lilies, the lilies, excuse me, they are nicely arranged. We boil eggs and then color them. And I need you to know you really should see Jenny McGregor's amazing artistry in coloring eggs. Uh, there is always a ham in somebody's oven on Easter. Thank you, Kathleen, for that last week. For some reason, this is the day we invite somebody to church. All of this activity, and we do all in the name of mystery and hope. And though we may half understand it, we still make our way to church or some kind of Easter observance where folk are just gathering, maybe just in community, amen? We don't come, though, without our struggle and anxiety. And I think this is because, among other things, as we often say, We've just got too much information. We've got too much information. Sometimes the struggles of life eclipse the joy of Easter. Sometimes the cries of the world are louder than the gospel, the good news of God's love for all of us. Loud noise and then sometimes just the subtle hum of Racism and homophobia and sexism are edging out the message of hope. Every time I'm ready to declare he lives, the gun violence in this nation makes me holler, but wait a minute, the rape culture that is so pervasive forces another narrative that says he lives, but, you know, the bully culture which has made suicide endemic causes us to move beyond Hallelujah, so wait a minute, maybe Jesus lived, but I declare it seems like we are dying in here. Preacher, what are you talking about? Well, it seems that we've got too much information to declare happy Easter. I'm so ready to get to the good news, but I cannot escape the reality that somebody's life is a series of Good Fridays because some folk live crucified lives every day. Do I have a witness? Yes. Oh yes, so on this Resurrection Sunday, 
Sunday as badly as I want to say hallelujah Christ lives hence we live I hold in tension the reality that many of our brothers and sisters down the street and around the world live the kinds of lives where death has not loosened its grip so as we sing hallelujah we've got to add an addendum hallelujah and God have mercy amen on all who remain As a renowned priest, Father Michael Flager, St. Sabine in Chicago, church smack dab in the middle of gun violence, gang and drug-ridden realities, etc., he says, we cannot really embrace the fullness of resurrection until every one of our brothers and sisters can rise. Too much information, too much information. At our fingertips, the social media giving us breaking news from around the world. We've got too much information, it seems. And yet, Easter Resurrection Sunday stands up to all of our information. What we know and what we think we know. But the thing that makes Easter, and yes, a week later, again, it's still Easter, what makes it so powerful is that it stands right in the midst of the world's suffering and declares rise. It falls on the calendar every year while major scandals pervade folks' lives. It falls on the calendar the week that so many terrible things are happening around this world. Amen. In Pakistan and in Afghanistan and yes, in Brussels, but in Chicago and in Canton and Potsdam. Do I have a witness today? And declares he Easter doesn't say put on rose-colored glasses to block out the realities of life and say let's just have a feel-good day. No, no. Easter stands square in the middle of injustice and oppression and declares rise anew. Now have the power to get up from there. Easter doesn't ask you to believe it. It doesn't say now here is the narrative. You've got to inculcate every theological perspective that the church has crafted for the Easter event. Easter doesn't ask that we come with full assurance and belief. Easter doesn't ask that we check off every rule of doctrine to be assured a place in the story. Easter says, no, no, come on with your doubts. Come with your reticence. Come, go and come and because long ago, I know maybe you promised your grandmother you would come to church, but put on your clothes and come with trepidation. Easter has nerve, amen? It has audacity. Easter knows the powers at work in the world. Those very powers, political powers, religious powers, crucify Jesus. Yeah. But Easter knows that God has all power. I can sit down right there because there it is. <laughs> God has all power, and by faith, we're counting on that power. People all over the world push through the incredulous every year. We push through the theological and doctrinal differences of our traditions, and we make our way to some place where somebody is telling the Easter story, amen? Why? Because I just believe deep in our hearts, in ourselves, we just know that we can live again. Nobody goes to church on Easter by accident. No. no. Nobody goes to church on Easter by accident. Nobody just happens upon our gospel service, even today. No, no, we are here on purpose and with just a hint of trust a kernel of curiosity into this resurrection business. An invitation comes to us. It turns out that you're in the right place at the right time for real. Amen. For God has dispatched a heavenly courier to your address. Go on and check your heart and you'll find an invitation not just to the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, but an invitation to the resurrection of our own lives. Glory. God, through the risen Christ, invites each of us to leave the confines of our own private forms of death, our own systemic forms of death, our own cultural forms of death, our own 
tombs. Yes, God's invitation allows us to put all that keeps us from wholeness on notice. That's why, as the scripture says, early that morning, while it was still dark, we can meet Mary Magdalene and the others at the tomb. We may still have our doubts and our questions, but we still show up. We may be tempted to leave this nonsensical, ridiculous resurrection business and go home to our human realities, but I believe it's precisely those realities that make us stay. Even as we look suspiciously at the tomb, we show up at the tomb every year, looking to hear the angels' questions. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He has been raised, just like he said he would. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they detail the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Each gospel writer tells the story differently. The gospel of John only speaks of Mary Magdalene and a couple of other of Jesus' disciples. The other gospels speak of the women. Whichever account you read, all of them have this common strand that all who showed up at the tomb that morning, they were perplexed and confused and confounded because when they showed up at the tomb, they never expected a resurrection. They showed up to finish off the burial. Amen? Spices in hand to adorn Jesus' body. They never expected a resurrection, and sometimes neither do we. We, we often don't expect life to triumph over death. The brutal realities of crucifixion feel much more real to us than the reality of resurrection. We simply don't expect resurrection in our lives or some of our communities. Communities where poverty is the common denominator have been written off in some folks' minds, not because we are uncaring, but because the situation is so grim in some parts of the world that our human minds can't conceive just how they will rise, how they will live again. Do I have a witness today? Mm -hmm. Resurrection, resurrection. One theologian, renowned Dr. Diana Bass Butler, she, she reminds us, we who may be skeptical, that the evidence for the resurrection, she says, is all around us, not in some ancient text, or Jesus' bones, or a DNA sample. Rather, the historical evidence for the resurrection is Jesus living in us. It is the transformative power of the Holy Spirit bringing back to life that which was dead, for we are the evidence. See, this is what we often forget. I believe we've got to remind ourselves over and over that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you and me. Now that should knock somebody off. <coughs> The same yes. power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you and in me. Tell me what you cannot accomplish, what you cannot do. What is it that you cannot overcome? I know it looks like the world is winning, but like one preacher said, the power of God's love continues to pervade the world undeterred by waves of death and destruction. Yeah. Jesus found himself on Calvary's cross because of his bringing the good news of God's love to all people. Brian Zahn said, the death of Jesus is not a kind of quid pro quo by which God gains the necessary capital to forgive sinners. No, no. Jesus does not save us from God. Jesus reveals God. He died on that cross, which is a shameful way to die, because he was revealing God, showing us the face of God, touching the untouchables of, of society, challenging empire, hanging out on the margins, tending to the poor, giving value to women, reminding us to not be slaves to rules, making the first last and the last first brought him to that cross. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. After they laid him in a borrowed tomb and rolled the big heavy stone in front of the entrance to the tomb to seal it, it was done. The mission has ended in disaster, it seems. And the 
Women who go to the tomb, they carry this reality, all oh, but God. Those who came to the tomb were looking for the dead Jesus and not a risen Christ. Jesus told them that God would conquer death and raise him from the dead on the third day. It turns out that all is not lost. It is Resurrection Sunday and Resurrection Season. Happy Easter, church. Happy Easter, Easter shows us that crucifixion has never had and will never be the last word. You know, only in the Gospel of Luke does the messenger or messengers or the angels ask that question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? They said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has been risen. Remember, he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Humanity must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day he would rise. Then they remembered his words. I believe, you know what, the Spirit calls us to hear the angels' questions for our own lives, our communities, our nations, and world. One theologian captures it. Why do we look for life among poisonous cynicism, toxic worry, and unchangeable past mistakes? Why? Why do we as a country look for life among war and torture and capital punishment and oppression of minorities and the poor? Why? We are resurrection people, so why are you looking for the living among the dead as we can look at our own private lives? Why do we, I know y'all have heard this, my mother used to say this to me all the time, why do you do the same things expecting a different result? <laughs> yeah. Let us ask ourselves this, where am I looking for life in the midst of death? I believe the Lenten and Easter seasons are perfect opportunities to examine ourselves, to really pay attention to what is taking up space, trying to take up residence in our lives, but it does not belong there. Where am I looking for life among those habits, activities, ways, and thinking that are not life-giving? When will I accept that it's Easter? And, and, and don't, don't forget that Easter can handle our stuff. Easter can handle when we've messed up again. Amen? We must claim it for our own lives. As one theologian stated, Easter morning is God's clearest statement that the world is different and that those who follow in the pathway of the risen Lord are called to live life differently. The good news is not something to observe. It is something that demands our response. We allow the resurrection to rise up within us. First of all, it is no longer just a historical event, amen? Mm -hmm. The resurrection is, is with us all the time. As one theologian said, every time Jesus rises in our hearts in new ways, the resurrection happens again and again. Every time we see Jesus where we did not recognize him before, you know, in the faces of those who are different from us, you know, in the revelatory moments of life, Jesus rises anew and invites each of us to leave the confines of our own private forms of death, our own tombs our own prejudices and limitations, fears and untruths. Let us, friends, let us not walk away from the Easter resurrection experience as if nothing has changed. No longer is it time to stand idly by, to observe, to wait, to accept the world the way it is. I think I'll go on and end with Brian McLaren's words. He said, it turns out that death is not the last word. Violence is not the last word. Hate is not the last word. Money is not the last word. Intimidation is not the last word. Political power is not the last word. Condemnation is not the last word. Betrayal and fa failure are not the last word. No. Like those brave clothes, each of them are left like rags in the tomb. Amen? And from that tomb arises Christ. This glorious Easter day calls us to resurrection, our own. For we, friends, have been called to rise, to do life, 
different 